Doch nun zu unserem Gast. It is a great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker of tonight, former President of the Republic of Poland, Alexander Kwasniewski. Let me mention just a very few milestones of his long political career. I'll start with spring 1989. There he participated in the roundtable negotiations in Poland that initiated the peaceful transformation from communism to democracy. Originally a member of the Polish United Workers' Party, he became a co-founder and first chairperson of the Social Democratic Party of Poland. In 1995, Alexander Kwasniewski was elected to the presidency. It was during his two terms in office that the new Polish constitution was enacted in 97 and that Poland joined NATO and the European Union. During his presidency, he fostered close ties and regional cooperation with Poland's neighbors. In this context, he also actively supported Ukraine's sovereignty and democratization. Dear President Kwasniewski, we are honored that you made it tonight to the University of Bern, and now the floor is all yours. Mr. Rector, Madame Steens, uh, Excellencies, Ambassadors, ladies, gentlemen, dear students. Uh, first of all, I'm very honored and I'm very thankful for your invitation uh, because this year is uh, very special for uh, my country, for my region and for me personally. But before I will start to say some remarks about this uh, quite long, because 30 years long period, I want to congratulate to East uh, Europe uh, studies uh, in the uh, University of Bern and University of Fribourg. Uh, ten years is uh, something, and I, I see, I see, I see um, uh, your successes. But I can promise you that uh, your job will be not boring. Uh, and if you will be active in these problems of my region, you will have a lot of uh, interesting uh, situation, changing of the situation, challenges, um, researches, etc. Et um, because that's, that is our history, and I think that is also our, our future. Um, by the way, uh, in, in my country, we don't like uh, when uh, you describe Poland as an Eastern European country because uh, we feel ourselves as a much more central located country in, in Europe, especially if you see such real geography of our continent from <laughs> Lisbon to Ural mountains, we are exactly in the center. Um, uh, and, uh, but if you see the history of, uh, of, of Poland and some countries in our region, Czechia, Slovakia, you see that we are for very, very many centuries, we were very much connected, much more with the West than with the East. So, so I think if it would be possible to change something in your uh, uh, structure, it would be not bad to call your studies as a Central and Eastern studies. Uh, and it would, be, it would be maybe some, my small contribution to, 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 to your activities. Well, you see a man who was a witness of all this 30 years, sometimes uh, author of uh, something, uh, sometimes really the, one of the registers of, 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 the, of the situation, because during roundtable 30 years ago, I was one of the leading person of these um, uh, talks, of these negotiations. I was, uh, because the structure of roundtable was a main roundtable, led by two persons, Mr. Wałęsa, leader of Solidarity Movement and Minister of Interior, General Kishchak, and then we had three main tables. One was, uh, and that is voice of next 30 years. <laughs> um, uh, 
and uh, three tables. One was for economic reforms, one was for political reforms, one was for trade unions pluralism. The main goal of this third table was to re-establish Solidarność as an official uh, trade union on uh, Polish um, uh, scene. And I was chairman, co-chairman of this table for, for trade unions, together with uh, Mr. Mazowiecki, who was nominated after election 89, um, first non-communist uh, prime minister of Poland and one of leaders of, of trade unions, uh, Romuald Sosnowski. So, round table, I'm leader of this talks. Uh, then uh, next events, I was a leader of, of the party, uh, number two in the parliament, Social Democratic Party. Then I was president since 95 until 2005. I'm sorry that I will be not very modest now, but uh, I have to say to you that I'm only Polish president who was re-elected until now. So, and of course, uh, uh, all these events, everything what happened in these ter last 30 years is, is very familiar with, for me and, and, and I feel myself uh, as, as, a, as a part of this, of this changes. So maybe sometimes, my opinion are not very subjective, are quite, uh, not very objective, are, are quite subject. Uh, this year is not only the year of um, uh, 30 years of, of, of the beginning of, 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 of the change, of, of round table, etc. This year for us in Poland and in uh, Central and Eastern Europe is the year of next uh, two important uh, anniversaries. Uh, the next one is uh, 99, 20 years of uh, NATO membership. And as you know, uh, the first uh, enlargement of NATO was uh, done with three countries from our region, Poland, uh, Czech Republic, and uh, Hungary. And this year we have also 15 years of our full membership into European Union, 2004, 1st of May. And this enlargement of European Union was, uh, was with Poland, Czechia, Slovakia, Hungary, um, uh, uh, Baltic states um, uh, uh, and Slovenia, so the quite uh, many of, of the countries from, from our region. And I want to say about these three main, main uh, anniversaries because I think um, uh, it's interesting to understand why it happened and uh, how we see this process now from this 30 years perspective. So let me allow uh, start with uh, round table and and uh, 30 years of this uh, of these uh, events uh, for us in poland uh, the year 89 is a really miracle year because uh, three things happen which were uh, not very much expected and frankly speaking were not expected at all it was uh, round table talks and agreement of round table the round table started in february 89 it was finished at the beginning of april as a consequence of Roundtable was the first almost democratic election to, to, to Polish Parliament, almost because to the second chamber which was re-established uh, after uh, negotiations of Roundtable, Senate, it was really fully democratic election and for uh, Parliament, for the lower chamber, same. It was um, a political contract uh, in which uh, uh, the majority was guaranteed for, uh, for the leaning Communist Party. And then, of course, as a consequence of this uh, election, um, uh, which were a huge victory of solidarity movement, of opposition, the result of that was a uh, first government in the region of Central and Eastern Europe led by non-communist, by Mr. Tadeusz Mazowiecki. In fact, it was a coalition government um, uh, organized with the political forces of the opposition and of the uh, by previous system, uh, Communist Party, Peasant Party, etc. But these three uh, events were very interlinked because each one was a consequence of, of, um, of the previous one. Of course, Polish roundtable and everything that happened in Poland opened the door for next uh, possible uh, possible. Um, uh, uh, situation in, 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 in the region. You mentioned in your introduction um, uh, Hungary and this um, and, and the uh, fence uh, on the border between uh, Hungary and Austria. Then uh, we had a um, uh, 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 demonstration in, in, in Czech, Czechoslovakia those time uh, which in, in, in Hungary. 
uh, dramatic, at the end of the year, dramatic um, revolution with a lot of blood and victims in Romania. So this year was, uh, was really the special year. We changed, we changed the, uh, the, the region and the changed the world very much. And first, it's, it's interesting to understand why it was possible, why it happened. And of course, it's a long story, but I will try to, 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 to say about all the things as brief as possible. Of course, the crisis of communism was the reason number one, and uh, uh, this, this crisis was quite obvious, even for the leaders of communist uh, parties. Uh, and in my opinion, if some historian wants to say <laughs> or want, wants to, to decide when is a date, or what is a date when the communist uh, uh, is finished, it's not the year 89, and it's of course not the year 91 when it was the end of the Soviet Union. In my opinion, the real end of communism as an ideological system, as a political system which was um, uh, even uh, accepted by many groups in the West, you know, the communist parties and the people connected with the communist party, the, end, the real end of the communism is the year 1968, is the Czechoslovakia, and this is invasion of the Warsaw Pact against the uh, Czechoslovakian Communist Party and the reforms which Czechs, Czechoslovakia prepared at uh, those time. Because uh, 68 showed for everybody in the world, including communist camp, that this system is absolutely unable for reforms. It's, it's, it's impossible to, even if the leading force of the reforms is Communist Party, the system, because of, of the position of the Soviet Union, cannot accept such, um, such reforms. But of course, the crisis of communism one is, is one of the main elements of this great change which happened in the year 1989. Uh, of course, that is ideological crisis, but that is also the crisis of the system. It means the weakness of all the structures of, of, of the system, administration, um, uh, uh, communist parties, uh, uh, the system was totally uh, exhausted. Uh, in the economy, uh, the such very visible uh, evidence of that was a lack of um, competitiveness of the um, uh, communist uh, economies. Um, uh, in the, and the military field, it was also the lack of such competitiveness, especially when Ronald Reagan um, announced this uh, uh, Stars War, this uh, uh, very um, uh, high um, investments in the newest technologies uh, for um, uh, military uh, equipment. And at the social level, it was uh, the deepest alienation of the Communist Party among uh, own um, uh, society. And this alienation created the situation that the dialogue was almost impossible. And of course, um, uh, this alienation of, of the uh, ruling uh, party uh, had such consequences like uh, the strengthening of uh, various groups of, um, uh, um, uh, of opposition. So, in Poland, of course, the role of the opposition, especially after the year 1980, when um, explode the movement of solidarity, it was very special because Poland was a little bit different uh, country among, uh, let's say, uh, central this, uh, communist countries. Uh, because we had a lot of, uh, from the very beginning, uh, since uh, 40, uh, 45, in Poland, this uh, uh, mood of, of, of resistance, the mood of opposition was quite strong, and we observed such um, uh, actions against the ruling Communist Party in the year 56, 70, 76, and then 80, it was a solidarity movement, which changed the landscape, political landscape in Poland fully because uh, in the, on the peak of, of uh, development of solidarity movement, this um, trade union, which in fact was a much more political social movement, not only trade union, had almost 10 million um, members. So that is something what we can describe as a situation in many communist countries, including uh, Soviet Union, but in Poland, in Czechoslovakia, in Hungary, this situation, which I described very briefly, uh, was quite visible. Of course, the year 89, and this change was possible also because of international environment, because of this international 
situation and, 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 and influence. One person I, I, I mentioned, Ronald Reagan, of course, the very anti-Soviet policy of, uh, of, of Reagan was an important element, uh, especially this uh, uh, fight on, uh, on the field of, of uh, military expenditures was very important for that. Uh, but I, I, I want to mention also two names which, which uh, uh, were, uh, which are still very important to understand uh, this process. Uh, the first is uh, uh, John Paul II, Karol Wojtyla, the Pope. He was elected uh, exactly, I think, 41 years ago in, 70, in October, some, yesterday. I think it was exactly the anniversary of of his election as a first non-Italian uh, pope after 400 years of Italians in Vatican. And why uh, this uh, um, uh, pope was so important? Because, first of all, his election was a signal that something impossible is possible. Uh, very psychological, but, but it was true. The second, uh, the first visit of the pope in Poland in the year 79, and still that is a time of, of such deep communism, because, you know, today, very few remember that those times we had Brezhnev in, 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 in uh, Moscow, Honecker in Berlin, Husak in Prague. They were not very liberal communists. They were uh, hardliners. Uh, and, of course, the visit of, of, of uh, Pope in Poland and this organization of huge uh, events with uh, millions of people, they gave such signal to the people that it's possible to organize something without official structures without the government and even against the government. And it was uh, really the psychological change because uh, something what was even unimaginable was possible in, in, in the reality. And I think the, the role, and of course uh, that is one element of the role of, of, of the Pope, the second, he was uh, the strong um, uh, supporter and strong advocate, especially in his international contacts of the Central and Eastern Europe. He spoke about the necessity of the, of the changes in, the, in this region. And he used even uh, some, um, uh, in the year 79, what I remember uh, was enough um, uh, matured to, 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 to understand what, what he said. It was in Gniezno, in uh, ancient Polish capital. Uh, he said in his homily such thing that maybe, of course I quote not, not exactly, but the sense was uh, following, that Look, maybe the election of the first of the Pope, who is uh, from Slavic country, means that one day we can be together, West and East. Of course, it was like a prophecy. It was a, like a prophecy that maybe one day this world, which is divided by iron curtain, which is divided on two strong blocks, which nuclear weapon, Soviet bloc and, and Western bloc, can be, can be united. And it was 79. So I think the role of, of this uh, great um, uh, man is necessary to underline. And uh, next, who I want to mention, and with this person probably the process would be much more complicated and maybe very much slow down, is Gorbachev. Because the perestroika and everything what Gorbachev started in Soviet Union since 85 created some also window of, of opportunity. The Gorbachev's position vis-a-vis uh, um, -vis, uh, Eastern, Central and Eastern European countries was, was much more moderate as Brezhnev's position. Uh, one day he decided to resign of so-called Brezhnev's doctrine, that if some country will have a problem to protect the socialism, uh, the other socialist countries, are obliged to, 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 to offer some help. And what means this help, we know very well, because uh, we observed this, this special support in 56 in Hungary and in 68 in, in, in uh, Czechoslovakia. So I think the, the, the perestroika was an extremely important um, uh, factor for all these processes um, in the year 1989. And it's unfair, in my opinion, because in many discussions, we don't like to, to, to underline the role of Gorbachev. I think that is unfair because his role as a man who decided to liberalize this system of uh, uh, Soviet Union, and especially he decided to liberalize, he was not an ideal person, and I, I, I know something about it, but uh, he, was, he, he, he started maybe without the imagination what will happen at the end. 
it's a different story. But uh, realistically speaking, his role as a man who, uh, for example, decided to give more space for, for um, uh, other countries like Poland, who, for example, accepted our roundtable talks, and he was even interested to see what, what will be next, how we Communist Party can manage this problem, this process, was also uh, uh, interesting and, and, and but important um, uh, impact uh, in this year, uh, 1989. Then some words about round table, because uh, today in Poland especially we have a still very uh, such, um, let's say, dynamic discussion about the uh, round table, and we have two approaches to this uh, round table um, um, talks. Uh, after 30 years. Of course, I have to say at the beginning that I'm in this first school, because this first school speaks that Roundtable was historical achievement and gave us the chance to do what we positively have done in the last 30, 30 years. This peaceful solution, this peaceful uh, way was the best what we could offer in the year uh, 89 for Poland and for the region. Of course, we have a second school, more and more um, uh, active in Poland now, that it was some kind of conspiracy. It was a deal between part of the opposition and Communist uh, Party, and uh, it was um, uh, the chance to uh, not to, to make a revolution, to, 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 to uh, eliminate the people from the previous regime from the political life, and um, uh, of course, that is theoretical construction because nobody knows what would happen in such a way. But that is this second approach. Of course, I, I tell you, I am very much with this first approach because, in my opinion, it was really historical achievement. And it was uh, um, uh, the uh, strong proof that on the both sides, on the side of Communist Party and on the side of Solidarność, we had enough wisdom we had enough imagination and we had enough strength to do it because it was extremely difficult to find some kind of, um, of, of, of compromise. Why it was so complicated? Well, because of these uh, conditions which I described earlier, but also from a very psychological point of view because these negotiations on the round table in Poland were between oppressors and the victims. Because the, it was um, fantastic to watch, I was a witness of that, that two uh, participants of this, um, many participants of these talks from the Solidarity side um, uh, went to, to the uh, palace and they shaked hand to Minister for Interior who decided about um, uh, prisons for these uh, this people. And he... Um, he kept him quite quite long time in the prison. So psychologically, it was really difficult because it was on the beginning of the talks was deep lack of trust, of mutual trust, what is quite uh, natural. Uh, but I underline again, it was uh, absolutely the sign of, of wisdom and, and imagination from both sides. Of course, politically um, analyzing the situation is necessary to say, and I think that is a good lesson for uh, different roundtable negotiations in the world, that such negotiations are possible uh, when two sides of negotiations are weak, not strong. Because if two sides are strong, you have a fight. If one side is strong and another side is weak, you have no negotiations, you have some kind of dictate. But if the partners are enough weak, not too much, but enough, that is a chance to find some, some um, um, uh, solutions. And it happened, it happened in Poland. Because communists understood very well that time of this old system is finished. And Solidarność understood that after almost 10 years, after the beginning of the movement, they are not enough strong, they have uh, problems, and the people are waiting for something positive. The people is not prepared for next fight, for next conflict, for next um, um, uh, confrontation. And it was, it was um, uh, great. Then, during the negotiations, the situation was changing. The first, what, psychologically speaking again, what was very important um, uh, moment, the change of the picture of the 
of the enemy. Because spending so much time together discussing in the uh, spirit of common um, uh, values of, com of, of uh, common interest, you know, this, this picture of the enemy is changing. You see that, okay, we have a different position, we have a different uh, uh, own experiences, but we are ready to do something together. We are ready to find some, some positive, positive um, uh, compromise and also uh, happen. And of course, uh, what was a philosophy of, of this um, roundtable? It was Dialogue, it was a clever, wise compromise. Unfortunately, in today's politics, and that is a problem not only of Poland, uh, that, uh, that is a pol problem of many countries. Today, when we speak compromise, the connotation of this uh, word is, is generally negative. And that is wrong, because compromise really this is a fundamental issue for our cohabitation in the world. Without compromise, probably humanity will not, wouldn't exist today. Because, uh, you know, what is what is alternative for for compromise? It's only the, my interest, yes, or or fight for my interest. You know, the compromise, and I think one of very important tasks for new generation of politicians in the world in the world is rehabilitation of this idea of compromise, of clever, responsible compromise. But this is. A little bit different story. We found this, this compromise, and the result of this compromise was something what is um, uh, maybe sounds like a paradox, but is not, is that Polish way after round table talks, it was evolutionary revolution. Evolutionary revolution. Why? Because evolutionary, because the way, step by step, by the way, many steps were very, very fast. Because everything would happen after the election in June was was uh, uh, very much speed up. Uh, it was an evolutionary way, and why revolution? Because finally we achieved revolutionary goals. And you know, you see Poland beginning of '89. Poland is country in Soviet camp. Poland is um, uh, has no democracy. We have ruling Communist Party and no democratic institutions. Poland has state-owned economy. And 80% of Polish export is going to Comecon countries, to the eastern countries, the, the, the countries of the, of the bloc. What's happened as a result of um, uh, this evolutionary revolution? Poland today is a democratic state. Poland has free market economy. And 80% of Polish export is going to the west to the European Union, 40% to Germany, etc. And that is a real revolution. From the non-democratic country to democratic country, from state-owned central, uh, centralized economy to, to market economy, from the West economically, from the East to the, to the West. And of course, um, uh, if I can a little bit um, uh, to, to uh, discuss with the opponents of, of my approach uh, to, to the round table and the role of round table in our history, these uh, people who said, no, for Poland it would be better to have revolution, some kind of revolution, because then we would have a, uh, stronger, better results, uh, etc. I have a lot of doubts. My first uh, doubt is that it's not proved, because nobody uh, tried such such um, uh, way in, 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 in our region. But when we want to go a little bit um, uh, farther, not uh, to, to in Europe, but in some other countries, I think all revolutionary concepts, Cuba, others, were not very successful, Soviet Union as well, after October Revolution. But I think that is something what, what is um, um, uh, very doubtful. And the um, uh, second important point to, uh, of, of my um, criticism is that it's necessary to understand everything what happened in the year 89, especially in this period of the first month of, month of 89, is still in the situation of existing Soviet Union, existing uh, Warsaw Pact, existing um, uh, um, uh, Soviet bloc. And in my opinion, two revolutionary moves could create a lot of tensions and a lot of, 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 of um, uh, well, frankly speaking, victims as well. And, and, and I don't know how much 
international uh, environment for such revolutionary way would be possible in this, in this uh, period uh, of time. As a last, uh, as a last uh, example, I can tell you, I was also a witness of, of very special, very unique conversation between uh, General Jaruzelski, who was uh, the leader of Communist Party in Poland, and George W. Bush, uh, George Bush, uh, George Walker, Bush, senior father. Uh, as a president of the United States, he came to Poland. Uh, it was uh, after uh, June election. It was probably July uh, 89. And the question, very hot in Poland, was because as a part of these changes uh, accepted um, during roundtable, we re-establish in Poland position of the president. Because during communist time, Poland had collective president, so-called uh, state council. But we decided to, 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 to have a president again. And it was a question who should be the president. And of course, the president those time was elected in, by National Assembly. After that, uh, is, is elected in uh, general election. And I remember very well the arguments of Bush to the leaders of opposition, Wałęsa and, and his uh, advisors, let help Jaruzelski to be elected president of Poland in the year 89. And the simple argument, the simplest one, argument of, of Bush was we cannot destroy position of Gorbachev. United States in the, in the year 89 were, first of all, very much interested to keep Gorbachev as a leader uh, of, 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 of Soviet Union, and they had a lot of problems uh, with weakening position of Gorbachev. And how position was weak would be, uh, we will have uh, evidence soon, because the putsch was in 91, uh, yes, it was uh, summer 91. So I think this international environment also was, was not prepared to have such revolutionary way. So in my opinion, this evolutionary revolution was the best what we could offer for Poland for next um, uh, years. Then I will say something about this 30 years as a whole. Now NATO, somewhat. Why Poland fight it so much to be, to be NATO, NATO member? Uh, I, I understand that especially now we have in the, in, in, in the world discussion, uh, maybe it was wrong because uh, now we have um, the problem with, with Russia, which uh, is very much humiliated because of, of um, enlargement of NATO. Uh, then we have such argument that uh, Russians, uh, they had, uh, Soviets, they had a uh, promise uh, from American side, British side, and the French side that uh, enlargement of NATO will go not farther as to, to the GDR because of reunification of, of Germany. Uh, and of course, uh, I read such uh, articles that probably this enlargement of NATO was uh, one of the biggest uh, geostrategic mistakes of, of, um, um, of the end of 20th century. I have absolutely different opinion. Uh, first of all, look from our perspective, it's not only Polish perspective, perspective of Central and Eastern European countries. We have finally our sovereignty and independence. We can decide as we want to, to decide. And we have quite alternatives, uh, following alternative. To stay in some kind of gray zone means to be neutral or to ask to be full member of NATO. And of course, neutrality was a good idea, especially in the time when the world was divided. And for example, for Austrians, neutrality was a source of many successes and of many, let's say, benefits, because to play a role as a moderator, as a facilitator, as a partner for both sides, East and West, sometimes is quite easy. But it was a time of Cold War. But after Cold War, for us, the alternative was not neutrality versus uh, NATO membership. For us, it was uh, uh, alternative NATO membership versus gray zone. And this gray zone, especially in the first years of 90s, was extremely dangerous for us. For, not only for Poland, for all, for whole region. And please allow me that I 
tell you as an argument, I mentioned this person now, Gorbachev. He was, uh, it's here, uh, I think, two years before our entry, 97. Gorbachev was awarded in Warsaw by a uh, very famous Polish weekly newspaper, Politica. And, of course, I participated in the ceremonies, and next day I invited him to the presidential palace for breakfast. And I heard his speech during the ceremonies. He was very much against NATO enlargement. So I said to myself, no, I will not discuss during the breakfast these NATO issues because I want to have a pleasant breakfast and not, <laughs> not such, such difficult breakfast. So, but, of course, I, I'm speaking Russian as well, so we spoke Russian. Uh, and I asked him, well, Mikhail Sergeyevich, please tell me, uh, what is going in Russia? Oh, disaster, <laughs> terrible. You know, nothing is working. You know, this, uh, everything is stolen. Uh, disaster. Okay. And tell me something about uh, Soviet army. Oh, disaster, terrible. Everything is stolen, <laughs> even nuclear weapon. Nobody is, is, is um, leading all these uh, things. Terrible. And of course, I'm speaking briefly. And tell me something about your successor, Mr. Yeltsin. Oh, disaster, terrible, you know. <laughs> Never sober, you know. The, the wrong decision, mistakes, etc. Okay. And then we finished the breakfast. And I said, oh, Mikhail Sergeyevich, time is over, so thank you very much. It was nice to, to discuss with you fantastic conversation. We didn't say nothing of NATO. Oh, very good, that, Alexander, that you mentioned NATO. Why you are going to NATO? Why you want to be a NATO member? Gorbachev asked. I said, Mikhail Sergeyevich, after everything what you said to me about Soviet, about Russia, about Russian army, about Yeltsin, I'm going immediately to my desk and I will fall, I will call to Clinton to take us as, as soon as possible to NATO. But that is, of course, sounds like a joke, but it wasn't a joke. It was a reality of the 90s and it was a question. What was for us better to stay in such gray zone with all these unpredictable events which um, uh, happened in, in, in the biggest uh, neighbor in Russia, Russian Federation, or to ask for, uh, for NATO. And we were accepted. I have to say that I'm, until now, extremely grateful to Clinton, President of the United States, and Madeleine Albright, those time Secretary of State. She was a very good partner for enlargement because she was born in Czechoslovakia. She, she understood our region very, very well. And I think, thanks to this decision of enlargement, Central Europe, Central and Euro Eastern Europe today is safe. We can um, uh, uh, keep this security in the region. And even what is very important as well, this region can export the security to the next region like, like Balkans, um, uh, etc. So all this... Uh, arguments that enlargement was, uh, was uh, wrong, in my opinion, are, first of all, are historical, but secondly, they are absolutely uh, uh, not right, because uh, the alternative for this, for the lack of, uh, or the result of, of lack of NATO enlargement, would be some kind of gray zone with all consequences of that. I think uh, permanent destabilization of, of, of the region. And uh, I know that among us is an uh, ambassador of Ukraine, but I think uh, the Ukrainian case is a very good example. What means to stay in the gray zone? Because if, if, uh, I think if Ukraine uh, would uh, do two things, which one, uh, one was done but in a different way. The first, uh, Ukraine resigned because of the strong pressure from the, from the world of nuclear weapon. And of course, and then you remember this famous Budapest referendum when the permanent members of Security Council of the United Nations signed full guarantees for integra integrity, integral, um, territorial integrity of, of Ukraine. It was signed by five permanent members, China, Russia, uh, uh, France, uh, uh, United Kingdom. Um, and, and you know what happened in the year 2014. So this is first. Probably if Ukraine would have nuclear weapon, everything what we see would be impossible. And the second, I think, Ukraine-NATO means real territorial integrity of Ukraine, and it means more security in Central and Eastern Europe, means more security in the world. And that is 
why we celebrate today 20 years of NATO membership, and I think it was one of the uh, most important and positive decisions from, uh, from uh, of this time and, and uh, during my presidency. Next point is uh, European Union, and of course this the story is, is, is uh, maybe shorter because uh, it was a long way, and the decision that Poland uh, and other countries, European countries, uh, want to be in European Union was uh, decided in the beginning of the 90s. For us, it was absolutely obvious that because of our history, because of our links with the, with the West, with the, 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 from uh, since the beginning of Polish state uh, more than 1,000 years ago, that is our place. And one of our ambitions is to be back in this European family. The process was very difficult, long. We started 91, we finished 2004, 13 years. But we fulfilled this process successfully. And uh, for us, two things in this, um, um, uh, in, in this European Union were the most important. The first, values because uh, European Union means values, democracy, rules of law, human rights, rights for minorities, um, um, all the things. And for us, European Union was a place, and we decided signing the treaties, that we are agree with these fundamental, fundamental values of, of European Union. And I think for construction of the state, especially during transition period, such guidelines like values of European Union is something extremely positive because we know what we have to do because we know to be the country with rules of law, with uh, full protection of human rights, etc. Of course, important for us was, of course, European funds because they help us to speed up the process of development and to overlap, the overlap this um, overjump, this, this gap of um, uh, of um, uh, our, uh, let's say, handi handicap situation in, in many fields. Um, uh, and of course, uh, I have to say that these funds played and are playing still extremely important role for development in the Eastern, um, the Central and Eastern European countries um, uh, region. And of course, what is also very important we are in the same European family, what means less conflicts, less tensions, more reconciliation, more possibilities of cooperation, etc. For us, for Polish, from Polish perspective, two things were in NATO enlargement, in, in EU enlargement, extremely important. Finally, after a thousand years of very difficult neighborhood with Germany, we are, together with our big neighbor Germany, in the same alliance. We are together in NATO, and we are together in the European Union. It means that the border, which created a lot of tensions in the past between Poland and Germany, is an internal border of the European Union. And in fact, it's, it's not a border. It's, it's, it's only the line on, on the map. So that is that's the next important um, uh, element. And now again. We have a lot of critics, especially from the West, after everything what uh, happened in the last years, that it was a mistake, this enlargement was a mistake. Uh, I don't want to discuss details. Of course, nobody is perfect, and uh, many countries of, of um, uh, uh, our region uh, did a lot of mistakes. I will say something about it. But I think, generally speaking, from historical point of view, enlargement was a great decision. Great decision, especially in context of 21st century. Why? Because in the 21st century, we have a new architecture of, of the world. Time of Cold War is finished. Time of leading role of the United States is finished. Now we have a time when new centers of politics, of the economy, of the influence are creating. We know very well, and it is not necessary to be a prophet to, to know it, that two centers for 20, in 10, 21st century will play a crucial role, China and United States. And the question is, what role will play Europe as a continent? And of course, only positive answer is that Europe can play the role of a of third important center of the world in the 21st century only if we'll be integrated, 
stronger, with more people, well-educated people, with bigger potential of the economy, with bigger military potential, and it means that enlargement for this position of Europe is absolutely most important. Without that, it would be difficult to stay in this old, let's say, um, um, uh, type of European Union uh, to be partner, to be player on this uh, international, this global, global um, uh, scene. So that's, that is absolutely fundamental question. If someone who wants to see Europe as an important center of the world and not only as a you know, interesting place for tourism or something like that, we have to be integrated, uh, united, and with this potential which um, Central and Eastern Europe offers. I don't speak about uh, labor forces. I'm sure that without labor forces from our part of Europe, Western Europe has no chances for um, uh, economic development. I don't speak about um, uh, these um, uh, sources of destabilization which we can see in, in, in many uh, countries. In my opinion, enlargement uh, was really historical, positive, historical, great decision of European Union. And today, Europe, even having such problems like Brexit and after Brexit, uh, we are, we are um, uh, uh, ready, we are prepared. I don't know how, how we will use this opportunity, but we, as a Europeans, we are prepared to be this important center of the global world of the 21st uh, century. So I, I have to say, again, one word about Ukraine. I read now before our meeting that uh, probably Brexit will happen because some kind of uh, agreement is uh, uh, accepted. Uh, we'll see what the uh, British Parliament will say, but in any case, I think everybody with Brexit is so exhausted that it's time to, 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 to say goodbye. Um, um, uh, but that is good news for Ukraine because now you have more space in Europe and in European <laughs> Union. And uh, even we were joking a little bit before the meeting that UK and Ukraine, is, your name starts with you so that you can even sit on the place of the United Kingdom in, in, all this, in all these European meetings if you, if, if, if you, if you want. And, and I know that you want, but if Europe is enough clever to accept you. Okay, then next point, 30 years. 30 years, quite long time. And uh, I have to say that this uh, 30 years is really a success story for, for Poland. And I think it's a success story for, for our region. Uh, if, if sometimes you travel to Poland, to, to Czechia or Slovakia, you see the change. You see the different countries. You see better roads. You see good restaurants. You see good economies. You see a lot of, of, of positive um, um, changes which would be impossible in different, in, in old system. Uh, Poland has uh, probably one of the best economies in sense of development in Europe. Uh, since uh, the year 1993, Poland has a permanent growth of GDP quarter to quarter. It's unbelievable. Um, and today even the growth is on the level 3.5, 3.7, almost 4%, sometimes more than 4%. Poland has um, uh, a huge um, uh, development of export. As I said the main partners are Western countries, especially Germany. Poland has a um, uh, very low rate of the lowest rate of unemployment. Poland has uh, quite uh, uh, strong currency. So that is really great, great um, uh, success story. What is what was difficult? We decided uh, to build capitalism, market economy, without capital. But we uh, didn't do such mistake like, like our Eastern neighbors, Russia, Ukraine. We decided to make this capitalism with real capital. So we invited a lot of um, uh, capital from the, from the West, for, for banking system, for investments, etc. And today, I have to say that uh, this, uh, of course, after 30 years, we can say that Polish um, capitalism has uh, own sources of, of um, uh, financing, and, uh, but the beginning was, was very, very, very complicated. Poland has such success because we decided for peaceful way, this evolutionary revolution, what I, I said. Poland has such success because from the very beginning we decentralized our state, 
we created strong uh, local authorities. And this decision was really the first after the change because this almost democratic election to Polish parliament was in the year, uh, in June uh, 89. And the first fully democratic election to the local, in the, on the local level was uh, June uh, 1990. So it means 11, 11 uh, uh, one year after, or even, even something, something less. So decentralization was, was the next important source of the success. And uh, next is a uh, Polish uh, entrepreneurial spirit, what was uh, surprising for many of us, including myself, because today Poland is a country with more than 2 million small and middle-sized companies. They employed something around 7 million people, and more than 45% of Polish GDP is coming from this sector. And it shows that these SMEs, so-called small and middle-sized companies, they created really such uh, strong um, um, uh, movement for, for, for progress, for, for, for business, for export, um, uh, etc. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, I, I use this uh, very, very uh, visible argument uh, to show the progress. Um, and that will be not very nice for, for, for our Ukrainian friends, but what to say. Uh, Poland and Ukraine, we started this period of, of 30 years ago. GDP per capita in our countries were comparable. It was more or less the same. Today, Polish, per capi, per Polish GDP per capita, per person, is almost four times bigger as in Ukraine. And that's his, that's his example. If you have this, this um, uh, way, and what I didn't mention that I want, what was also a source of Polish success, that for strategic goals in the last 30 years, we had very, let's say, wide support of the political parties and from the society. We had so-called very multi-partisan uh, support for these main goals, uh, European Union, NATO, democracy, etc. And that was very, very important. We changed in this period many governments, but the main strategic goals stayed the same. And, and it was our, our uh, advantage. Um, uh, and second, uh, and I think that is the, the weakness of, of, of Ukraine, that you change the governments, and each new government is coming with a new idea of, of strategic goals, uh, or almost new idea of strategic goal, and that is a real problem. And then the next such very visible argument, when we were started to be a member of European Union, Polish GDP per capita to compare with German, and Germany is a very rich country, as you know, um, uh, uh, Polish uh, GDP per capita was 40% of German. Today, after 15 years of our membership, that is 60%. So this, we, we are going closer. Of course, to be on the level of Germany is, is difficult, but we are, we are uh, closer. Okay, so that is Polish success. I will not say more about it because I understand that uh, myself and Poland should be modest in this uh, <laughs> in these things. Especially, I want to say something about everything what is going now, because I know that in, the, in Europe uh, we have um, uh, some uh, lack of understanding or criticism to some uh, situation which happened in, in our region, in Hungary with, with uh, Orban policies, in Poland with, with, new, with the government of, of peace, the Law and Justice Party. And of course, uh, uh, that is important to know from why it, it happened, why from one side we speak about success story and everything is going so well, and then we have such dramatic or such deep change of the policies <coughs> now. And I want to say this problem is, is not only Polish or Hungarian problem. We have a new era in the politics in the, in the world. And that is very important to understand it. The, the Trump is not from Poland. Um, Salvini is not from Poland. Um, uh, Madame Le Pen is not connected with Poland. Um, so what's happened? Why we have this wave of populism? Why we have this uh, wave of uh, such national egoism, sometimes nationalism, 
in the world why we have these this problems which we observe also to some extent in my country. Long story again, but briefly speaking, I, I tell you, we have a new era in the politics. I know something about it because I was a president at the end of one era and at the beginning and the eve of new era. Um, what means this new era? The main factors of this new era are following. First, technological revolution. We have absolutely new situation. That this technological revolution is so fast, is so unprecedented, is so changing our life so deep, so much, and so quick, that we have a problem with many groups of the people who cannot adopt all this new situation easily. And that that's creates frustration, that creates um, uh, alienation, that creates uh, exclusion, that creates a lot of such, uh, such um, uh, things. Uh, and of course, this technological revolution is uh, irreversible, um, uh, but it will create more and more problems. We are very short to the explosion of artificial intelligence. We are soon, um, uh, we will see soon uh, this robotization. We will have an absolutely dramatic uh, change on the labor market with all kinds of, of, of problems connected with that. So the first is new technologies. The second is a crisis, economic crisis, which we had in many countries, maybe not here in Switzerland, but in many countries um, uh, of the world. And uh, what means this crisis, especially with the peak of the crisis 2008-9, that we have deeper or stronger inequalities in the world, we have more unemployed young people, well-educated young people in the world, and we have, um, and we have um, also a um, uh, lack of trust to fundamental institutions of market capitalist economy. We have lack of trust to the banks, to the insurance companies, to the uh, investment funds, etc., etc. And that is what creates, again, a lot of uh, frustration, a lot of fears, a lot of, uh, of um, um, uh, misunderstandings, etc. The third point is, of course, something what you see here in Switzerland as well, is a migration, which creates also a lot of fears. Um, uh, is, is, also is a problem because how to, how to manage this, this issue. And the problem with migration is even more complicated because migration is, a, is, is, is also a irreversible process. Because if from one side you have a countries with uh, higher and, and higher longevity, the people are living longer and longer, and the problem with the people on the labor market, and from other side you see the, the demographic boom in Africa and Asia, so it's absolutely obvious that we will have this tendencies, this tendencies, this, this migration for, for very, very long time, maybe forever. But that it creates, again, a lot of fears, a lot of, a lot of disappointments, frustration, etc. And next uh, point is a, is a crisis of traditional democracy, of our style of communication. I think that is something what today all old parties uh, finally understood, that we have no chances to find the contact the, with, with the voters using all methods. Political parties, some debates, some uh, meetings. We are, Ukraine today is a very progressive example because the success of President Zelensky is, is, is an absolutely uh, strong um, argument that new era means new, new type, new style of communication between politicians and, and, and the voters. And I think that is the next difficult problem. And um, I think all these things created this situation that uh, old parties, old type of politicians, so-called mainstream politicians, they have a problems in uh, confrontation with, uh, with um, uh, this uh, new type of, of, of politicians using these new, new forms of, uh, of communication. Because these processes are ir irreversible, in my opinion, is necessary to, to prepare for this new, new era. And I guess that we'll see more and more politicians understanding this new, new era and uh, using this new, new instrument. But of course, um, I said all these things not to, to, to find some um, nice excuse for something what is unacceptable. Because I think understanding this 
new situation, understanding new era, understanding new communication, we should say, and I say as a former president of Poland, we are obliged and we should be determined to fight and to protect these fundamental values of our societies, of our life, of the world which is uh, so-called democratic uh, world. It's necessary to protect uh, uh, democratic values, it's necessary to protect human rights, it's necessary to protect uh, independence of judiciary, it's necessary to protect the uh, rights of minorities. We are obliged, not only because we signed the treaties of European Union, but because that is the fundament of our civilization. This is a fundament of the civilization of, 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 the, uh, of the West. Uh, and that is what uh, I would like to say to, to Mr. Orban and what I'm saying uh, very often uh, when I'm, I'm speaking in, in Poland. I give the... Uh, I'm giving interview or, or uh, I participate in some discussions, we should protect all these values and of course we should respect also the rules of democracy that during one election we have one winner, next election we have a different winner. That is, that is something what means democracy. But democracy means also protection of these fundamental values, of these fundamental uh, things, especially constitution. And then, because I would like to give you some time for uh, questions, uh, last point, really last point uh, about, uh, about the future. Well, we have this, this, this new time, this new era, and I think this new era is very important to keep uh, some uh, kind of, uh, of, of our unity around these this basic um, uh, values. Uh, I'm sure that Europe will have a future if we will stay united, if we will uh, keep this, uh, we will um, um, uh, develop and, and will um, deepen our integration. We'll have, as a European Union, more, more common uh, policies. Uh, I think Europe, uh, Central and Eastern Europe, uh, can and will play an important role in such united European Union and, 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 and Europe. Uh, we have a lot of new challenges. We have, unfortunately, as a Europe, we have now in the world uh, less friends and more competitors, diplomatically speaking, and maybe even, even um, uh, sometimes enemies, uh, because uh, this competition uh, is, is tough. And if you see new politics of the United States, you see that for America, Europe today is no longer such source of common history of American roots, etc. It's much more the, the, the element of, of, of the strong competition in many fields. Uh, Chinese, they, they see Europe as well as a first of all competitor. So I think if you want to not only survive in such world, but we want to develop, we want to protect uh, our heritage, we want to protect, um, uh, we want to create good life for next generation, it's necessary to be united, to face all these challenges together, because uh, majority of the challenges need such global approach, climate change, uh, technological revolution, uh, migration, uh, um, uh, security, fight against terrorism, etc. And I think we, we should do it, and uh, the, the contribution, the role of uh, Eastern and Central Europe should be in all these processes much stronger as now. And I hope that uh, also my government, the government which will continue the job, because last election in Poland uh, finished last Sunday, gave this strong mandate for Law and Justice Party for next um, four years. So I think that this understanding will be deeper and Poland will be back in this main stream of such thinking about future, future of, of Europe. And of course, speaking so much and about this European uh, unity and European integration, I have to say that uh, we know that we can count on Switzerland as usual. I don't uh, argue now and I will not campaign uh, 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 such idea to have Switzerland in European Union now, uh, and uh, because 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 we are uh, here in this um, uh, Central European Studies, uh, I have to say that in my opinion the priority should be on the Ukrainian side. So we have time. Don't don't, don't worry. 
but uh, I, I, I tell you that uh, Switzerland is important in this European concept because your role is, uh, as a neutral country as well, is, is very active. Is very active, what, what I respect very much, and, and I'm glad that um, I can say these words to you here in Bern. So thank you very much for your attention. I'd like to thank you very much for your uh, talk and your thoughts uh, about 30 years of change in Central and Eastern Europe. I totally agree. It's just a long tradition to call this studies program Eastern Europe, but I totally agree with you. Um, we decided uh, that we would like to give our students the rare opportunity to ask um, a few questions. We are slightly running out of time, so keep your questions um, very concise, if you can. Looking back at the year 1989, and with you, after these almost 30 years, reflecting your thoughts, would there be something that you have maybe made differently back then? Well, yes, of course, it's a good question. <laughs> Unfortunately, a little bit too late. <laughs> uh, and, uh, I, I, of course, we did some mistakes. I think the main mistake, and this main mistake uh, today has a consequences uh, to some extent, is the success of, of uh, Peace Party. We, uh, because, you know, each such deep process like uh, economic transition creates two groups. The one group are beneficiaries of the reforms, and the second are the losers of the reforms. And the losers of the reforms in Polish um, situation was the people from the um, coal mines, steelworks, uh, military uh, factories, uh, from some regions which uh, were very much connected with this type of industry, and they lost job. They had a problem because uh, some of them, they were not enough able, not enough, uh, were not too, 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 too so young <laughs> to, to find new job, to, 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 to start new education, etc. So we created really the group of, um, of uh, really the losers of, 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 the, of the reforms. And these losers today, uh, they are voters, uh, what, what I can understand fully. This is a little bit like in the United States that uh, the people who lost the job in this uh, central states of the United States uh, voted for, for, for Mr. Trump. That, that, that's, that's his natural reaction. So I think this element um, was the first. We were so engaged in the progress that we lost a good understanding of the people with, in, in, in the worst uh, situation. I think that was first. The second probably was possible to, to do more for some, um, uh, for example, innovation in our, in our uh, uh, economy or some more social programs, what was extremely complicated because the situation of budget in this period, 89 and after, was, was dramatic. We had the inflation, the highest inflation in Poland in the year 1990 was something around 650%. 650 percent. You know, today we have inflation 2.7 percent. Uh, so, but the answer is, of course, something was possible to do better, and uh, still we analyze this, this uh, let's say, mistakes. Maybe not, but weaknesses. But I have one excuse for that. And please, please remember. But that is very important. We started the process which was absolutely unprecedented was unknown. If you want to read the book, how to go from primitive capitalism to the most developed capitalism, you, from the, to the welfare state, etc., you can find thousands of books in all libraries of the world. Some of authors were awarded by Nobel Prize. But in the year 1989 and 1990, we had no one book in the world, no one book, how to go from the communist system with state-owned centralized um, uh, economy to the market economy. It was no one book about it. 
And all these books, now we have a lot of books, but these books, these books, this is the result of our job, our efforts, our mistakes, suffering of the people. That, 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 that is the result. So I understand, and, and for example, such very typical discussion in Poland still, because Polish government, first Polish government after of this, in this period decided to organize so -called, in the economy so-called shock therapy. The author of the shock therapy was the Minister of Finance, Deputy Prime Minister Leszek Balcerowicz. And he has a lot of critics now in, 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 in Poland that the shock therapy was, um, some even the strongest critics speak that it was a shock but without therapy, you know, very, very tough, <laughs> tough critics. But frankly speaking, if you see the countries surrounding us, Ukraine again is a good example. I, I don't know if such not shock therapy would be better. If this therapy would take not one year, let's say, but 10 years, would be better. I'm not so sure. Of course, we have no evidence. That's a theoretical discussion. But in my opinion still, of course, probably what I mentioned before, something would be better, um, we should do better. But, but I, I think that, that is something what, what, what if you see results after 30 years, we can, we can um, uh, justify it. We can justify it because uh, it was a pioneer way. It was absolutely pioneer way. Through, through unknown territories with mistakes, but first of all, with a lot of efforts, with a lot of determination, with a lot of, of, of uh, such positive spirit of the people. Because without that, it would be impossible to, to achieve. Next, please. <laughs> Dear Mr. President, I would like to ask you, because you mentioned you t you're kind of optimistic about Poland's future, uh, how do you, uh, what do you think about chances for Polexit? After Sunday's election, do you think peace will try to pursue the Polexit? Yeah. Well, I think, well, no, I, I don't believe in Polexit. I tell you why, because still in Poland, uh, the huge majority of the people, something around, or even more than 80% are in favor of European Union. So I don't. I don't believe that in Poland, because of the public opinion, it's possible for exit. In Polish referendum, if, because you know Brexit was organized after the referendum, if you want to organize referendum in Poland about Poland um, uh, stay or leave, I think today the result is 80 to... Uh, hmm? Yeah, 6% is in favor of living, so no, no chance. The problem is different, I think, and that is my criticism to, 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 to my government. I think Poland should be in the mainstream of European Union, especially now after Brexit, because Poland is expected, even the partner for France and Germany, to decide about the future of Europe. The politics, Eurosceptical politics of today's government, uh, I think, is, is not the best. Yeah, but I hope uh, that in the second term of this government, they will, let's say, um, uh, they will uh, maybe not fully change this politics, but they will understand much more that, that we have a place not on the margin of, of European Union, but, but um, uh, in, in the middle of the, of the, of the process. So of course, we have one the real problem to be in this uh, leading group of EU, that is a euro currency is the Eurozone. Poland is not in Eurozone, and I think uh, practically, even if we don't like to speak about two-speed uh, Europe, uh, so we have to some extent two-speed Europe, because we have Eurozone and we have uh, non-Eurozone countries. Uh, I, I'm in very much in favor of, of Eurozone and, and Poland in Euro, Eurozone, but this government has, has different opinion. Of course, they have mandate to to, 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 to make this politics, but I think finally Poland will be in Eurozone as well. It is a question, question of, um, uh, of time. But Paul exit, that cannot, cannot happen. And last uh, point, I tell you, I think if some who in Europe now, after all experience from United Kingdom, wants to make some kind of exit, <laughs> let's think twice or three times about it. Because that is something what uh, what is a massacre. You know, if you if you see what happened in in, in, in the United Kingdom, that is the best the best argument that let not uh, do it. And uh, I tell you, of course, for UK that is a dif is difficult process because that is divorce after 40 years of marriage. 
And, uh, and that is a mistake, because this year I will celebrate my 40 years of my marriage. <laughs> and I tell you, divorce, it would be the most stupid thing what I could do. <laughs> yeah, we, <laughs> that is a wonderful... Um... But this is also a message for young people. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have nothing to add here. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we are running out of time. And since we want to open the doors for five minutes to get some fresh air in and, and, and welcome our guests for the, uh, the roundtable discussion, um, we would like to thank you very much. And we hope uh, the students can approach you later on as well with their questions. It was truly very, very interesting. And uh, we thank you very much for having Thank you. you here. Thank you.